What I want to tell you, we are dealing with the climate of the past and uh, the history of that is that uh, uh, as Winston Churchill said, there is a, a lot of our future in our past and the better we know our past, uh, the better we will uh, be able to foresee what will happen in the future. So that's the reason why. And if we want to put in the right perspective what is happening on climates today, we have to look at the, at the climate of the past uh, and go to look and uh, having tools for understanding what is happening in the past. Our uh, climatic system is, uh, is very complicated and a delicate system. It works in uh, many different ways and things are simple in principle, are simple in principle because if you run a model uh, from uh, uh, many, many uh, different point of view and when I say model, we'll see what a model is, is a mathematical representation what, what the um, chemical, physical, geochemical processes are, um, are doing in the, in the, in the environment. Uh, if we do apply a mathematical model, for instance, to how clouds and aerosol is forming in the atmosphere, we'll see that things are repeating always at the same uh, time, at the same place, but uh, they are always different. So you, we can't reproduce exactly what is happening on climate. Uh, so that's the reason why we don't have an equation describing climate. You have an equation describing the, the movement of these. Uh, if I throw it uh, on the back, we can very well describe the movement of these because we know the shape, we know the mass, we need the velocity and the angle in which I throw it. But for climate, we don't have an equation that brings together everything. We have several equations, we have several tools that can describe how the climate works, but not exactly a single equation for all that. And this is what we are going to study. Good. Uh, we are looking at processes happening in many, many different uh, time and space scale. I mean, there are about four or four, 14 orders of magnitude in terms of time. So we, we are dealing with processes happening on a very short time scale, I'm saying milliseconds, so that's very, very short time scale, or other things happening on a longer time scale, processes, transport processes happening on a thousands of year scale. So very short reactions happening on a, on a millisecond scale, even less, or transport processes happening on a much longer time scale, hundreds or thousands of years moving masses of uh, oceanic masses from one place to another one, uh, it takes, uh, it takes uh, thousands of years. You know how much <clears throat> it takes for a molecule of water? If I drop a molecule of water in the North Atlantic, uh, it doesn't stay there. I mean, it undergoes to several processes, including evaporation and so on. But let's, let's consider that it doesn't evaporate, but it just travels across the ocean you know how much it takes to, to come back on the same place? After traveling for all the North Atlantic and then into the uh, Indian Ocean and then into the Pacific and then on the way back uh, to the North Atlantic. It takes a thousand years, so it is a long way. So still um, we are receiving back in the North Atlantic something that happened a thousand years ago, you know, in the medieval time. Uh, and again, uh, we are also considering things that are happening on about 14 orders of magnitude in terms of space and dimension. Uh, we have very small particles, very small molecules that react each other uh, and transform from one thing to another one. We have small dust or volcanic particles which are emitted and transported for uh, tens, hundreds or thousands of kilometers away. We have even stratospheric eruption, things happening at a very, very high altitude in our, in our atmosphere. And uh, at the same time, we have small particles, but we have very, very big reservoirs. Uh, we have the ocean, we have the atmosphere per se, we have things that are very, very big and uh, transport paths are very, very long. If you consider that we are now Today, looking at the uh, biomass burning tracers uh, emitted by the Australian fires that everybody follow in the last few months, we are now finding them in Antarctica, so thousands of kilometers away, exactly on the, on the pole, you know. So all those, trans all those species are emitted on the higher atmosphere and transported by winds 
down to the down to the remote remote continents. As we often in the Alps, for instance, uh, we have storms that brings the Saharan dust up to the up to the high latitude up to the north. So we have deposition of snow. Uh, which is uh, yellow, which is orange and yellow snow, because it's coming from the Saharan, Saharan region. We are considering a very different time scale, a very, very different time scale. I would say if you put on a turn of a, of a, of a watch the, 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 all, the geological, all the geological scale, I go back because I want to ask you a question, you know how, how old is our planet? How many years? The age of the Earth. Uh, I didn't. Three billion. Who offer more? Is four point five, four point six billion years old. So you are pretty close to that one. So it's very old. I mean, we can't even imagine that. You know, it's a very, very long time scale, and we don't have information of everything that happened on our history, you know. And often when we speak about paleoclimate, we are concentrated usually during the last few million years. So when I say few million years, I say three, five million years, because it's the period of time in which we have more information, because we have marine sediments, we have ice cores, we have tree rings, paleothemes, and also because uh, during the last three million years, five million years, continents were already in the position where they are today. So we are looking at the situation which is very similar to the one we have today. But nevertheless, we know about the Earth history quite far back in time. And when I say that the uh, Earth watch, if you put on a, on a turn of a watch uh, all the geological time scale, I mean, and we start from the very beginning, 4.55 uh, uh, billion years ago, I mean, you have the progress, the atmosphere, became ox oxygen rich, rich about uh, 2.3 billion years ago, uh, which is long time ago, more or less half of the, of the turn of the clock. And then, and then uh, if you look at that, uh, you have the dinosaurs appear more or less at this point, about 230 up to 65 million years ago, almost at the end of the day. And the first humans not us, I mean, not the sapiens, but the first humans appeared about two million years ago, just a few seconds before midnight, you know, to give you the idea of the, of the period of time we are uh, dealing with. And we will be most concentrated during the last few million years, so uh, we will consider the very last part of, the, of this uh, watch uh, looking at the, at the climate of the past although we will be very much interested in, in, in many different things. Uh, as you see, I mean, and as, as I said, uh, there are a lot of things happening in the atmosphere. This is a model done by uh, GIS, uh, is a Goddard Institute for Space Studies of NASA. They have a very nice uh, educational program there where you can look at fires, organic, sulfate, dust, sea salt, how they are spread around the globe. And as you see, for instance, uh, dust, uh, this plume of dust, which is, spread around, which is spread around the Atlantic Ocean, is coming from the Sahara Desert, you know, is coming from thousands of kilometers away. And this is a very, very peculiar, because Sahara dust is extremely rich in iron and other nutrients, you know, which is extremely important for the bioproductivity of the ocean. So all that plays an important role. But together with that, you'll see other sources, for instance, fires. As you see, I mean, transport is, com is pretty complex. You see all this dust which is transported from the Sahara Desert into the ocean. You see emission from the biomass, uh, for instance, from fire in, in, uh, in Africa and into the, into the ocean you see how sulfate and sea salt is transported across the, the North Atlantic. You see the influence of fires, sulfate, which are mostly emitted from the sea or also from a uh, continental region, how they are spread around. So we can look at all that, we can model all that, we can describe with the mathematical model the movement and the chemical reactions we are, which are 
uh, hidden behind behind all that. And you see the swirls of the, the uh, sea salt, which are transported and mobilized from the uh, from the ocean into the into the uh, major into the major continents, and vice versa, because most of the dust, most of the biomass which is produced into the uh, in, inland is then transported uh, uh, into the into the ocean. You see how Antarctica is quite isolated uh, from a uh, atmospheric point of view because there is a circle Antarctic current all around, turning around in a in a clockwise direction that brings the Antarctica quite well isolated. Nevertheless, I mean we have, for instance, uh, aerosol masses that are coming from either from South America or from Australia and New Zealand in Antarctica. And we can detect them looking at the, uh, at the um, things deposited in the snow. Uh, this is another uh, interesting thing because uh, we know that temperature changed. Uh, temperature is changing uh, very quickly. Uh, we all know that uh, the current changes are unprecedented in certainly in the last uh, millennia we are uh, currently our civilization built up about uh, okay let's say 10,000 years ago since 10,000 years ago climate is pretty stable uh, is unprecedented the stability of the climate we have in the last 10,000 years is, is quite strange I mean we do not fully understand why climate has been so stable during the last 1,000 years uh, sorry 10,000 years. But what we are doing now, we are literally accelerating and entering in one of those uh, events that we call abrupt climate changes. Well, abrupt climate changes, it means a jump in the temperature and other climatic parameters that appear uh, and happen in a short period of time, less than a, 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 a lifetime, so in about 40 years, uh, and which speed up the temperature up to four to six degrees in a very, very short time. This is what we call abrupt climate changes. And we never had something like that during an interglacial period. So during a period of time, very stable as the one that we have. We will deal about glacial period of time. We will deal about mild climate as we have today, but we will also deal with, uh, with abrupt climate changes like the one we had during glacial time, but never, never during uh, interglacial. But now we are facing those periods of time and so we are very much interested to look how climate changed uh, in the past. And this is uh, when we say that during the last, during the last century uh, the average temperature increase because of human warming, because the, of the anthropogenic warming, the, the uh, temperature increase of about uh, one degree from pre-industrial value, uh, that is in average surface temperature uh, increase uh, above uh, the, the, the um, uh, pre-industrial value of about one degree. But this is not spread equally all over the world. As you see, I mean, we have area of the planet which even cool down a little bit or other which, uh, which the temperature were much, much higher than the average. As I told you, the average increase is of about one degree in average, but you have area which cool down a little bit and the other area which uh, warm up very, very dramatically. So we'll see that the increase of the temperature has not been uniform, <coughs> but has been differentiated across, across the globe. So you can follow here the, 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 the calendar here going on. There are five year average from the uh, 18, uh, 1880 to 2017. You'll see how the temperature change is progressing. You'll see how uh, there are places where the, the basis, uh, the average temperature from year 1951, sorry, 1951 to 1980. This is our reference. Uh, if it is warmer of that is uh, yellow, orange and red. If it is cooler, then the average reference value 5180 is light blue, blue or deep blue. So you'll see how temperature change over the century. You'll see slightly warming uh, again at the end of the last of the last century with a warning here in Antarctic Peninsula and in Siberia and in the Arctic. As I told you, average 
increase of temperature during the last 120 years, so compared to the pre-industrial value, was of about one degree warming in average. But as you see, the distribution is not, is not equal all over the world. There are places where there are dramatically increasing temperature, uh, like in the Arctic, like in some other region, and those are referred as Arctic anomalies, you know, uh, Arctic amplification. And so this is uh, extremely important. Uh, there are proof of that, of course, because we can measure. Uh, there are direct data. There are models that confirm our findings. You know, there are a reason for that. And most of this is because of uh, uh, amplification, amplification systems, so what we call feedback effect. Feedbacks are reaction happening in the climate system which accelerate a certain, a certain input, you know. We have a, a forcing factor, the forcing factor alterate the climate, but if I have a positive feedback, I have something that happened which further increase the initial, initial input. I'll make a very easy example. Uh, again, in the Arctic, for instance, you know that most of the Arctic is covered by sea ice. Sea ice has a very nice white reflective, sur reflective surface. So the incoming solar radiation is touching the, uh, the, the surface, uh, you know, of the ice, and most of it is reflected back because the white reflect very well the incoming solar radiation. But if you have an increase in the temperature, the sea ice decreases in, in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in area, you know, and decrease and decrease and squeeze because of the warming of the, of the, of the, of the climate. So if you have a decrease in the, warm, in, in the area of the sea ice, the incoming solar radiation will, okay, be reflected by the sea ice, but will also heat the water. And the water is darker than the, than the snow and the ice. So where the radiation hit the, the water, it is absorbed and not reflected. And absorbing radiation means a further increase in the temperature. So we have two, two effects. This is called albedo effect, you know, because it's the reflection of the incoming solar radiation. But when, when the incoming solar radiation is touching the, uh, the water and it absorbs the, 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 the radiation, the temperature is growing up very, very quickly. So this is what we call a positive feedback. We have an initial forcing, which is the warming. The warming makes the, the, the sea ice decreasing, and then the further uh, absorption of the, of, the, of, the, um, uh, of the incoming radiation increase the temperature uh, very, very much. So all these is already affecting climate. We are in a situation today where uh, our climatic system is already in under threat, I mean, is under trouble because of this uh, warming. And there are many compartments in the, uh, many compartments in the environmental system which are already severely affected. You'll see here, and often during the last, during the next 30 hours of our class, we will see that. Uh, we will uh, represent time, usually on the, on the uh, y-axis and usually temperature or other parameters. I want to introduce the concept of proxy because sometimes we don't have a direct measurement of the temperature or precipitation, but we use a proxy which is a substitute of a parameter that we want to describe, you know. So I can tell you we have a fantastic record of temperature over the last hundred years because we have a several instrumental station where the temperature is measured with a very high precision and accuracy. But before that, we have very sparse record, you know, especially in some part of the world. Uh, nothing in many other part of the world. So if we want to reconstruct the temperature or precipitation or other parameters uh, quite far back in time, we need to have proxies. We need to have substitute of the parameters that we want to measure. And we do have many of them. We'll see it. We use isotopic uh, uh, composition of water to reconstruct the temperature of the past. We do use uh, carbon isotopic fingerprinting. We use pollen. We, we use tree rings. We use many things as proxy of the temperature of the past. So 
in this case, and we can also calibrate this and convert into temperature. So this is a very interesting paper appeared a few years ago, where you have a very general temperature curve that goes from 20,000 years ago. 20,000 years ago we were in the full glacial time, uh, and then uh, we went up, this is the, called the transition from a glacial to an interglacial. This is our uh, current uh, period of time, which is called an interglacial. It means it stays to in between two glacial period. Is the period in which we live. Is this is the last ten thousand years. This is where our civilization uh, developed. You know, our uh, literally our um, uh, history developed during the last ten thousand years. We, you know, from how many years we are around as a human beings, as a homo sapiens, our ancestors. A million, one thousand, one hundred thousand, five hundred thousand. Okay, homo sapiens is around the planet since uh, 250,000 years ago. Uh, we live together with our uh, cousins, like uh, uh, Florence's man, ha, like, as a Neanderthal man, and so on, for a quite long period of our lives. You know, at a certain point, we were the the, the guys that uh, won the, the 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 contest. You know, and uh, we are the only one uh, that survived. The only species that survived is the Homo sapiens. But still. In our blood, we still have a lot of genes coming from uh, the Neanderthal man. You know, we share with them part of our genetic uh, genetic uh, uh, heritage. Uh, for some of us, is more than for others, but uh, I mean, it's still present in a good part. Uh, so uh, we report in the in the axis here the temperature, and we'll see uh, the current period of time. The last ten thousand years, as I told you are incredibly stable. We never had something like that over the last few million years. Very, very stable. Uh, no abrupt changes. We will see what happened before that. I mean, we are bumping a bumping climate. Uh, and this is what we can expect for the future, projection into the future. We will deal with that uh, during the last part of the course, uh, where you see different scenarios. You probably heard about IPCC. Uh, we will come it into a minute. And IPCC uh, makes scenarios which are tightly linked to the emission of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Everything is converted in energy, so the numbers that you see here are the increase in watt per square meter, so the increasing energy due to different emission, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So we are more or less here, we are already bumping into the future, uh, so this increase is the one degree increase that I told you already that we are currently undergoing. This is anthropogenic increase. Is that's nothing to see with the natural trend, and this is how we will be into the future, depending on how good we will be to keep the emission of greenhouse gases into uh, into low value. So that's very important to see all that and to see. Uh, especially in, in uh, relationship with uh, the reconstruction of the climate of the past. And especially to see within these ranges, and this is called Paris range because it's in between 1.5 degree to 2 degree, which is the target given uh, from the COP21 in Paris 2016, that says, hey folks, uh, here we are, if we are able to keep the, the temperature within this interval to the, below 2 degrees, respect to the, uh, to the pre-industrial value, better 1.5 degree, we will still have chance to keep the planet within a livable, a livable threshold, you know. But if we are pushing it be, be, be above that, we don't know where we go. And still, within this range, you'll see how many environmental compartments you have which are uh, deeply influenced by, uh, by, by uh, climate changes. Uh, we call them tipping elements that are possibly uh, affected by increase of the temperature within the Paris range. So if the temperature will increase from 1.5 to 2.0 degree in the, in the near future. So already 
uh, WISE that stands for West Antarctic Ice Sheet is already compromised by that. I mean, so the, the increase of the temperature already make the West Antarctic Ice Sheet unstable. Greenland, Greenland is very, very affected, is very much affected by the increase of the temperature. Even within this very small, uh, very small uh, interval, alpine glaciers, they are literally disappearing uh, underneath our feet and coral reefs because of the increase of the temperature, because of the increase in the acidity, they are uh, dramatically uh, disappearing. Uh, things will happen if we will uh, go above this limit. Most of the tipping points that will be reached are related to the Amazonian uh, forest, uh, to the boreal forest, to thermal ion circulation, which is another a key issue to Sahel region, to uh, ENSO, which is a, a, a mode of, uh, of uh, circulation of uh, heat and mass and, and uh, East Antarctic ice sheet, permafrost, Arta Antar Arctic winter ice sheet. I forget to tell you that Arctic summer ice sheet is highly influenced because, as I told you, the ice in the Arctic, the sea ice is shrinking very, very quickly. I mean, I'll show you we lost about two-thirds of the ice, of the sea ice in the Arctic over the last 40 years dramatically decreased. So all that has to be uh, carefully considered. But if we want to put in the right perspective what is happening today, we have to look in the past. And as Winston Churchill said, Winston Churchill was not a paleoclimatologist, but he knew about history a lot. As I, tell, as I told you, he was saying that there is a lot of our uh, past in our future. So if we want to understand the future, let's look at into the past and see how the system worked. The good things and the good help for that is that we, we do have the IPCC. IPCC stands for uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It has uh, the main uh, headquarters in, in Switzerland, but is a, in a, is a uh, governmental organization, which is uh, uh, wrapping up and putting together the best results uh, dealing with climate science. They are coming out with uh, reports every five, six years with uh, general reports. The next one is due next year, but in between the general reports, and usually there are three main reports, one on science basis of climate change, one is on the impact of climate change on human beings on uh, uh, goods and services and the third one is on mitigation how we can mitigate current climate changes so these are the three main reports but together with those there are also uh, other several reports coming up uh, during the years the last three ones were fantastic i mean one that has been published at the end of 2018 and this the famous report on 1.5 degree uh, after the Paris Agreement, you know. Uh, then there was a, a, another interesting report, uh, which uh, was uh, last year, 2019, and it was on land, um, uh, impact of climate change on land. So all the agriculture, all the forestry has been considered and so on, very important. And finally, the last one, which appeared in, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, November, October 2019 was on uh, um, ocean and cryosphere. So our ocean and cryosphere uh, react to climate change. So all the acidity problem, all the instability of the glaciers, all the instability of the ice shelf have been, have been uh, duly considered by this report. So this is the official voice that we are dealing with. So basically we are also looking at uh, uh, impacts of climate change, uh, impacts on, uh, on uh, glaciers, for instance. Glaciers are among the sentinel of climate change. Those are reacting very, very quickly to climate change. Uh, they contribute a lot to sea level rise because when you melt a glacier, the water of the glacier goes straight away into the lakes maybe and then into the, into the river and then into the ocean. So they contribute to increase of uh, increase of uh, uh, of the sea level of course uh, if we sum up all the glaciers of the world excluding 
polar region, you know, excluding Antarctica, excluding Greenland, excluding uh, all other ice cap uh, in the polar region, the contribution, if we would melt all the glaciers of the world, would be of about 30 centimeters. It's not that much, you know, it's just, just, it's 30, it's good 30 centi centimeters, uh, which is quite enough. Uh, but the important thing is that, uh, I go back, if you melt all the other uh, polar regions, you know, including Antarctica, including Greenland, the sea level will probably rise of nearly 100 meters, you know, so 30 centimeters compared to 100 meters is not that much, but glacier as a sentinel of climate change will be the first that will melt. So in the next few decades, most of the glacier will be gone and therefore they will directly contribute straight away, very quickly to the increase of sea level, to the sea level in the next, in the next few years. Uh, there is now, uh, until the 18th century, we have proxies of sea level rise that tells us the increase of sea level was of about 2 millimeter per year. If we look in the most recent years, we know that from the beginning of this century, from the year 2000 to 2015, the rate in which the sea level increased was of about 3.6 millimeter per year, 2 compared to 3.6. If we look at the last four years on the period of time in between 2019, sorry, 2015, 2019, the increase of the sea level is of about 4.8 millimeter per year. So the velocity in which the sea level is increasing is very, very high, and steeper and steeper and steeper. So we are very much accelerating all that. So to give you an idea, this is Glacier de l'Argentière, is on the northern flank of Mont Blanc, uh, is a case study. Uh, this is how it was depicted in, uh, at the end of the 19th century. The ice was almost touching uh, the, the village. Uh, then it was a few years later, a few decades later, uh, this was the maximum of what we call the Little Ice Age, we will speak about that. This was a few years later with a picture. This was 1995, still visible from here. I went back there uh, in 2016 and in a good afternoon I say, okay, I do a hike and I go to see the glacier. I never saw it, you know, because it was so far away in 2016 that it was not even reachable in, in, in one good day of walk from, from the valley. I mean, so I had to give up I went there the day after and literally the glacier is, is, is completely gone. I mean, it's almost gone completely. And it's one of the biggest glaciers that we have in, in, the, in the Alps, especially because it's, uh, it's a north side glacier, it's, it's, um, it's facing the north, and so it's, uh, it's basically pretty well protected by the global warming uh, is, is there. So something that uh, we will speak about, I told you, we will be mostly concentrated over the last few million years, but we will also deal with the climate over the last uh, uh, hundreds of millions of years. Just to tell you that Earth is a very dynamic system. Earth is, uh, uh, is, is, going, is undergoing a several uh, different processes in the, in the environment, and it changed because of many, many different reasons. So climate in our planet changed because of many different reasons. So if we have a very long time scale, sorry, here the scale is reversed, we have the age on this axis and the time on this. We have four panels indicating different time span. Here is the last 300 millions of years. We had dinosaurs around here. Uh, this is the last three million years. We explode, I mean, it's a zoom over the last three million years. This is the last 50,000 years. Uh, you know, the very, the last glacial maximum, the transition in our period of time, which is here, and this is the last 1,000 years. So we are in full historical time here, you know. So let's go here. If you look at here, you see that there are differences in temperature, because again, here is a difference in temperature, average temperature of the planet. Uh, we reached a maximum about uh, 60 million years ago, uh, which is called uh, Eocene 
Paleocene thermal maximum, uh, which is an important period of time. And since then, our planet is consistently cooling down very, very slowly, you know. So, mm, uh, you say, but why are we speaking about global warming if the planet is cooling since millions of years? But then we have to go into details, because devils uh, is hidden in details, you know, very often. So we have to go to look at details. Uh, what, causes, what is causing the, the, these changes, I mean? We have to look to tectonic. We have to look at the movement of the continent. We have to look at the, how the Earth works on a very long time scale. You know, the, the strength of the Sun increased since the very beginning of the life of our planet, so 4.55 billion years ago, and it slightly increased. So the strength of the Sun at the beginning of life of our planet was about 30% less. So we had 30% less radiation incoming in our planet. So we should have been completely frozen down because 30% less in incoming solar radiation means a frozen, pla a frozen planet. But still, we always had, uh, in, during the last 4.5 billion years, we always had water in our planet. So there was something, some processes happening that kept the temperature within a certain, a certain interval. And what happened during the very, very long time period of the year, of the, of the time, is that there the were processes, and we'll see that, that kept the temperature very, very mild, very similar to what we do with the thermostat that we have in our houses. You, know? you set the temperature at 20 degrees, and wherever cold is outside, you still be very safe in your 20 degree temperature in your house. Because the switch turn on and off the temperature following the climatic signal. If it is too cold, it pumps the, the, the heating off on and it warm up. And if it is too warm, it switches it off and it goes down. So we, we have in our climatic system on a very long time scale, a regulator is an on-off system which acts as a thermostat, you know, and keeps the temperature very mild in our planet. So that's something which works on a very, very long time scale. And differences in temperature might be pretty important. And I make a long story short, this thermostat regulator is mostly driven by greenhouse gas, CO2, carbon dioxide, you know. We'll see how it cycles and how we'll keep the temperature uh, within these parameters. Then, if we zoom a little bit, within the last uh, 3 million years. So if we are during the last 3 million years, so we zoom what happens here, uh, we do have bumping in our system. We always had bumping in our system, you know. It's not visible here because when we look at the record of temperature or precipitation of the past, we don't have enough resolution. So we can't see very tiny uh, bumping and tiny uh, changes. So if we go here and uh, zoom a little bit more on this detail, we see that over the last three million years, the climate changed from cold to warm, cold to warm, cold to warm. And since uh, you are very good mathematicians, you can apply a mathematical tool to look at the frequencies of those changes, you know. And if you look at that, oh, first of all, you see something. There are differences in between uh, the deeper part of the record and the upper part of the record. Uh, please consider that this is just a, a schematic, it's not re real paleoclimatic data, we will see them in a minute. But if you look at that, you see a very high frequency, low amplitude, and then when we arrive at a certain period of time, we see that the frequency is lower, but the amplitude is bigger. So nowadays, we are living in this period of time, where from a glacial to an interglacial, we have a very, very huge differences, sometimes uh, several degrees in, in uh, differences in temperature. So this is what we call glacial interglacial. We live in a glacial, sorry, we now live in an interglacial, but just 20,000 years ago, our ancestor lived on a, on a very, very cold uh, inter, uh, glacial period of time. You, everybody 
<coughs> you, everybody of you has seen the uh, Ice, uh, how is it called that cartoon, the Ice Age? Okay, everybody saw it, yeah? And more or less, we were not that far from reality, you know? Everything was covered, or not everything, but most of the, most of the places, especially at the northern latitude, were covered by ice. Uh, you know, uh, for instance, in the valleys in the Alps, not that far from here, uh, they were completely covered by ice. Adige Valley or uh, the Piave Valley was covered by one kilometer of ice, you know, and the glaciers were flowing down and arriving in the Padana Plain, uh, very close to Conegliano or Montebelluna in the northern side and so on. Uh, North America was completely covered by ice, uh, down to uh, Chicago and Philadelphia, they were covered above New York, they had more than one kilometer of ice, uh, you know. So everything was covered of ice here. And uh, as I told you, our ancestors are around as sapiens, as sapiens, uh, since uh, uh, more or less uh, 200,000, 250, 300,000 years ago. So we are living, uh, we as human beings, as sapiens, went through at least four ice ages, four full ice ages surviving to glaciation. And we were very clever hunting mammoth, uh, acting as gathering and hunting for a very long period of time until the very most recent years. Uh, so during the last period of time where we start uh, agriculture, we start uh, cultivation and so on. But then we come to the last, uh, uh, we, we zoom again in our record, so we go over the last uh, uh, few thousands of years, the last 50 thousands of years, uh, where you see still we have bumps, and then we have the transition from what we call the last glacial maximum, uh, the coldest period of time, which is this one, into the Holocene, into the last 10,000 years the warmest period we had over the last, not the warmest, but the most stable period of time we had during the last, I would say, million years. So that's incredibly stable. We never had something like this. Uh, I forgot to tell you something, that when we are looking at these important changes, and uh, which, as you see, I mean, there is a very good periodicity, and as I said, if you are a good mathematician, and you apply a mathematical tool on that, you can uh, disclose behind this record, it changes with a certain frequency, which is of about 40 kilo years, 41 kilo years on the deeper part here, and 100 kilo years. Uh, why that? Uh, if you look a little bit more in detail, about orbital parameters, so about the relative position of the Earth compared to the Sun, you'll see that uh, looking at the obliquity of the axis, the precession motion of the Earth, which is not orbiting in a, in a, in a is orbiting on a plane, but the plane of the orbit is slightly moving, and the orbit of the Earth is not circular, but is, is an ellipse, all those things combined together make the incoming solar radiation changing through time. So all these changes through times uh, are influencing the amount of energy arriving and therefore climate. So the reason why we are on a, on a very stable warm climate is because now insulation is pretty high. You know, there will be in the future where insulation will drop down again and we will get into a new ice age. But that's from a natural point of view. Uh, I told you that we are pushing a lot, uh, putting a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and most probably this period of time will be delayed of many, many thousands of years into the future. Uh, so again, uh, you see anyway how these changes are bumping during the last uh, uh, glacial, uh, uh, glacial times, we will see that is even more remark remarked than that. And then we have the transition, we have the very stable 10,000 years. And if you zoom again into, the, into a more detail and we look at the last historical time, you'll see that changes are not that uh, big, it's just a fraction of degree. 
we do have what we call um, anomalies on climate. We have millennial fluctuation, which are mostly linked to the uh, internal var natural variability of the climate system. And then, since the Industrial Revolution, we have the deep, the very big and steep increase in temperature due to, uh, to the anthropogenic warming. So we are studying the past because we want to understand how all this is uh, uh, happening and how fast it's happening. Something which is also very interesting, I told you, this is a cartoon, uh, just a very, very rough schematic of what is happening. If you translate this into scientific data, we come to something like this. This is even more expanded because we go back in time about 500 millions of years. Uh, you'll see four, uh, sorry, five panels in this, uh, in this graph. Uh, we see that the scale, there is an expansion, so we go from 500 million to 100 million, then we expand a little bit and we go from uh, 70 million to 10 million, and then 5 million to 1 million, and then 1 million to 20,000 years ago. So we expand the scale because we have more details. Uh, as, as deeper you go in time, the less detail, the less resolution you have in terms of climate, you know. So we do not have too many information here. You see that points are quite sparse. But as we move in the most recent years, I mean, that we have a very, very precise and a very, very detailed information. So what you have here, you see, anyway, this general long time trend, the uh, thermostat, as I told you, the, the effect of the thermostat of the Earth. This is clearly visible here and then here. Please consider that these are 500, 500 million years. Eh? This is just 100. So this deep depth is something like this, you know. So it's the regulation of climate on a very, very long time scale. And 500 years is really from a very good um, perspective, from a good archive point of view, <coughs> is re literally the limit that we can get. But I want to point out that since the, the Paleocene, Eocene maximum about 55 million years ago, the temperature is consistently going down, but at this period of time, for instance, greenhouse gases were much, much higher than today, more than double than today. Uh, and uh, then you'll see that there is a variability here. You can recognize here, this variability is better visible here because here we expand the scale. So this variability is the one that I show you here with the glacial interglacial changes. And you can recognize the, the, the very, very uh, high frequency, low amplitude here and the higher amplitude with the lower frequency in the most recent part of the record. And then let's move from the last glacial maximum into the current period of time. These are the last 20,000 years. The one that I uh, more or less showed here from the last glacial maximum to the current period of time, where you see I mean, two records we see here, one in deep blue, in dark blue, which is a record from Antarctica, and another one, which is in light blue here, which is remark with bumping in the system, which is a record from the northern hemisphere, which means in Greenland. Uh, both record very well what is happening, and uh, both records uh, that the, there is a very, very incredibly stable Holocene, the last 10,000 years, has been very, very stable. And the fact that we are here is most probably reflecting the fact that we had enough time uh, to settle down and to move from being uh, hunters and gatherers and we started the agriculture, we started to cultivation and so on. So uh, this is because of the extremely stable uh, climate that we have over the last 10,000 years. But you also see projections into this one. You see projection at the year 2050 or the year at the end of the century, 2100 and so on. So you see how this huge amount is comparable to a glacial interglacial change. So we are pushing the system literally out of, uh, out of control. And again, 
look at the scale on the last 60 million years. This is a reverse scale, 60 million is here and, and the zero is here. You don't see any more temperature as we have seen before. We had a temperature, sorry, uh, yes, we had temperature here. Uh, the, the graph is exactly the same, but instead of using temperature, we use a proxy of the temperature, which is, by the way, converted here. Again, we see the continuous decrease, more or less, during the last uh, 50 million years of the temperature, as I told you, due to the thermostatic effect of the Earth, and uh, the, most, uh, the most recent years, the Pleistocene, the, the last few million years. Uh, you'll see on top here the uh, presence of the Antarctic or, or the Northern Hemisphere ice sheet. Uh, we'll see that it was present uh, Antarctica since uh, most probably the last 30 million years. And we have clues also on, on the records that Antarctica was there during the last 30 million years. And more recently, Greenland that was present during the last five, three million years. So it built up Greenland. And on top of it, we have the uh, greenhouse gas, we have the CO2, which is the major key player of today warming. Uh, we'll see that the current day value, uh, which is, who knows, I tell you something, <laughs> at the exams there will be this question, what is the current CO2 concentration? I will ask you any time, you know, every exam. Second? Okay, something, something else? I'll be a bit more precise, please. Uh, okay, who offer? Is about 415. 415. So look at the, there is a, if you Google current CO2 concentration, you, you have exactly what it is today. You have the average of the year and so on. We are currently <laughs> above 400 parts per million. Uh, we are currently at about 415 parts per million over, I mean, in terms of average annual value. And who knows the, the, the interval of the natural uh, CO2 variation during the last million years. We have seen the temperature always went back and forth, you know, uh, during glacial interglacial time. What about CO2? It's more or less when it was low, when the, the CO2 is low during glacial period of time, is about 180 parts per million. And then when, it, when we had an interglacial, it went up to 280. So over the last 820,000 years ago, and this is a specific uh, uh, meaning why I say 820,000 years ago to today, the concentration always oscillating between 180 and 280. But then during the most recent years, we are at about 450. So it's more than 50%, uh, it's about 45% more than the average oscillation. That's due to anthropogenic activity. So here is the current day value. If we go back in time, we, we do have proxy of CO2. I mean, we, we, do, we do measure CO2 in the atmosphere today since the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, we do have method for measuring uh, for detecting CO2 in the atmosphere. Before that, we do measure directly CO2 in the atmosphere because we look at the tiny bubble which are entrapped into the ice. That's something very, very special. Ice is entrapping bubble and we do analyze the, the content of the air inside the bubble. So we can go back 820,000 years, you know. Uh, that, that's something we can do very well. So we do have data anyway, more or less up to here. And as you see, before that, we do not have any direct data from, from CO2 in the atmosphere. So you, we should look again, proxies of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere. When we look at that, uh, looking at boron isotope in marine sediments. While boron, boron has this chemistry, which is very similar to the one of, uh, of carbon, in terms of uh, chemical reaction in the ocean. 
So we do look at boron fraction action using boron 11, which is one of the isotopes of boron, uh, to look at the differences and to look at the uh, changes. And therefore, we can convert into CO2 changes. So as you see, I mean, if you want to have higher similar concentration that we have today, you have to go back in time about 30 million years. So we never had in our planet CO2 concentration as high as today. We had to go back about 25 to 30 million years to, to, to find a concentration so high in the atmosphere. And then, as I told you, if you go back into the Eocene, uh, Paleocene thermal maximum, you see you had high, very high concentration of CO2, higher than 1,000, probably 2,000 parts per million. But there, the temperature was definitely much higher. And still, I mean, I don't know if CO2 might be a poison at that concentration too. Probably a bit. I never breath uh, air at that, at, that, um, at, that, at that high concentration. So we can go back in time. As I told you, we are very much concentrated to this part of the curve uh, where we do have information. This is again uh, a real data set. Uh, I told you we had, we had this data set for the last um, three million years. I, the sketch was drawing bumps in between low and high, low and high temperature. This is a real data set that goes back about 3.4 million years ago. We'll see that there are many of these changes. Many changes that brought us, our planet, into a glacial stage and then into an interglacial, a glacial and an interglacial. We have about 100 different cycles like these. So it means that every cycle means that the ice sheet grow up and flow south, if we are speaking about the, the, the northern ice sheet, and then retreated during interglacial, and then went back again and retreated, and increasing side and decreasing. You know? So for many, many, many different times. We have tools to look at that. We do that looking at marine sediments, for instance, because marine sediments preserve the signal of what happened in the ocean productivity. You know that because of the sunlight, because of the nutrients that you have in the surface of the water, you build up a biological activity on the surface, which converts the light, the chemical species, into phytoplankton and zooplankton. These then precipitate and stay there in the sediment, and they build up year after year, century after century, and millennia, and millions of years, you know. And the species that are produced depends on the temperature. So if we can look at the species that we found with time and we are able to date the archive, we see that there are species which are better leaves in warm climate that are highly concentrated during interglacial and then they disappear during the, the glacial and so on and so forth. So we can reconstruct all this periodicity. And we'll see very well the differences in the record. Look at the last 1800, uh, 1800 uh, so the last 1.8 million years ago. You see you have very high frequent and low amplitude record and then as we get closer and closer to the current days we have a transition which goes up to a very ample, a very high difference in temperature in between a glacial and an interglacial but the frequency is, is lower. I tell you, we, we know why we have this oscillation. And as I told you, it's because of orbital parameters. So the amount of energy arriving on Earth. And it's mostly due to the tilt of the axis, it's mostly due to the plane of the orbit and to the eccentricity of the Earth. Those are the three major key players that drives the, the climate in between glacial and interglacial. You probably heard about the Milankovitch hypothesis. Have you ever heard his name, Milankovic? Milankovic was a, a, a Serbian astronomer that studied the movement of the, of the Earth, you know, and the inclination of the axis, the, the precession of the, of the um, orbit and so on. And he said, mm, the, the cycle that we found are tightly linked to the cycle that we have within the, within the, uh, within the, um, with, in, in the ice. 
So it's most probably those cycles are tightly linked to that. So he went to look at this and, okay, there are some yes and no, so we still, we still have to fully understand that, uh, but, I mean, it's a, good, uh, it's a good approximation of what was happening. So we have to stop at 12. Okay. Um, what we do not understand is why we had this transition from a very high frequent, when I say very high frequent, I say 41,000 years, keep this number in mind, to 100 kilo years. So during this transition, which is called mid-Pleistocene transition, which is a very key point in the climate history, we do have very important things happening. And we, I must be honest, since the beginning, we don't know exactly, we don't fully understand why we are now living in a 100 kilo year world. So every 100 kilo years we have a cycle instead of living in a 41 kilo years. And we will speak a lot about that during the coming years. So we do have all these uh, informations and as I said, I mean, we do have this very long information over the last 3.5 million years looking at marine sediments, looking at small diatoms, small radial areas, small species that are trapped into the sediments and we can detect and we can know exactly at which temperature they lived and therefore we can reconstruct this curve. But during the last, the most recent years, especially during the last 820,000 years, we do have information also from other archives, like ice cores. Ice cores are covering a maximum 800,000 years, 800,000 years of our planet life, which is quite enough. And they are extraordinary because uh, they are bringing inside not just the signal uh, of uh, the temperature, but Together, they carry also the signal of the uh, forcing. I told you, within the bubble, which are entrapped in the ice, and those uh, white dots that you see are um, the bubble of the air, within this uh, tiny bubble, you have the composition of the air, which can be dated back uh, to 800,000 years. So, since the air contain gases, like CO2, like methane, and since the ice contain dust, and all of them are proxies of climate change, are a forcing factor of climate change, because if I double CO2 concentration, or if I multiply by three the CO2 concentration, the temperature change, I have both information on forcing factor, CO2, methane, dust, and the temperature and the response of the climate. So we have also the information about how our climatic system is reacting and how what is happening. So this is extremely important. So that's the reason why we go often and that's most of the work I'm doing is drilling ice cores. We do have a project now in Antarctica that plans to go back in time not just 800,000 years, but we want to reach ice as old as 1.5 million years, covering this period of time, you know, covering the mid Pleistocene transition, a period of time which is still, uh, which still has a question mark, and we don't know why we had this transition. So we want to disentangle these, looking at very, very old ice, and that's the reason why we are aiming to reach ice of 1.5 million years. So drilling ice is not an easy task. I mean, uh, I'll show you uh, some movies. Uh, uh, it's very, very delicate task, but I mean, we can go back in depth three kilometers, uh, extracting ice cores, which are uh, cylinders of about 10 centimeter in diameter, one meter long each time and so on. Okay. So, I think that most of you have already, uh, most of you have already quite good knowledge on how climate system works. Uh, I was telling you about IPCC before. I was telling you about the the very last reports that IPCC published during the last few years. This is the one on uh, 1.5 degree. Th there is an Italian translation as well, but of course the English English version is available. 
you can download it for free in the in the IPCC website do that uh, of course a report is something like this I do not expect that you read it but there is something very very interesting and this is the summary for policy makers you know which is just 30 pages 35 pages written in a very very simple way uh, I would say politician proof so you know if a politician can read and understand it means that it's very well and plain written you know so you can read and understand and keep it in your file keep in your computer uh, they are very very interesting usually they are on a bullet point so very very well understandable very good and very good schematics and drawings so you can very well understand the other one I told you is climate change and land uh, very important and the very recent one is the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate this is the one that appeared in uh, October uh, 19 we are we ha ha hope to translate it in Italian during this this year and um, we, we are planning to do that I expect that you are um, you know about climate you have a, a at least a, some knowledge about the climate dynamics we don't go too much in detail on how the climate system works today and all the physical and science bases but anyway we will go a little bit through that I mean even uh, re, re, rediscussing a little bit uh, uh, the, the greenhouse gases and so on uh, another book that I will recommend it to you just for your we will not follow that one but we will sometime mention paper appearing on that and this is the warming papers this is a collection of articles scientific articles that goes from uh, the 18th century so from the papers of uh, Joseph Fourier, Svante Arrhenius, uh, uh, Tyndall and all these scientists that already hundreds of years ago made some calculations about global warming you know and say and and found the link in between uh, greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere and temperature it's not something that we know since a few years uh, Arrhenius we, who won the Nobel Prize 1870 or something like that uh, he said that if we double CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and if we double at that time you know we were at the in industrial value so at the very beginning so if we brought from 300 to 600 parts per million in the atmosphere he made a very rough calculation and he said the temperature will increase of about 5 degrees 1870 you know just considering the greenhouse gas effect considering that some molecule present in the atmosphere might warm the climate because they absorb the energy and they release the energy uh, coming from the from the land from the, the reflected from the land the outgoing uh, long wave radiation best estimates today ma made with the supercomputers and uh, taking into account all processing happening in the climate system including feedback effect and so on says that the temperature if we have a CO2 concentration of about 600 degrees sorry 600 part per million temperature would be about 5 degrees higher so it's exactly the same estimate that, that Jose, then, uh, Svante Arrhenius did in the 18, 1870s so in this collection of papers are about 15 papers that goes from the very beginning to today there are let's say the cornerstone of climate science papers you know published in very uh, high level journals and uh, describing very well uh, what happened and wh what are the re really the cornerstones of climate science um, keep it in your uh, in your record as well um, is a collection of papers so what we are dealing is uh, is exactly like that we are very much interested to the last of course to the period we live but over the last 140 years uh, many things happen and if you look and I told you the average temperature of our planet increase and this is what we call what we call a, um, a, a, an abrupt climate change so is uh, we are living now in one one of the abrupt climate change and the effect of the CO2 in the atmosphere the effect of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere already altered the equilibrium of our planet 
we are no longer living on a system, on a natural system. The equilibrium of our planet has been altered quite severely because of just this one increase in, in temperature. <coughs> so I split this curve in two. One is the temperature over land, which is much higher than one degree. And the other one is the temperature over the ocean, which is less than one degree because ocean has a very high heat capacity, you know, so uh, that's the big difference. So when you say the temperature already increase of one degree, I mean the average temperature over surface, over land. So it's something in between these two. But what we are very much interested in is this trend line, which as you see, I mean, there is a difference in, in the speed in which the, the, the changes is happening. And this is also more or less the same differences that I told you we are looking at when we look at the sea level rise. It was two millimeter per year last century. It is now 4.8 millimeter per year, more than double during the last five years. So ask a question, you know, and think about that. So it's, things are really, really going very, very, very quickly. If you put things together again, uh, this is a graph that brings together the population density, the person per, uh, cubi per uh, square kilometers, and you'll see already which, where are the tipping points. So where are already uh, com co environmental compartments which are affected by, by climate change. Uh, these are, for instance, uh, uh, alteration of, of course, in the Greenland ice sheet, in the Arctic sea ice, Himalayan glaciers uh, that are melting, uh, permafrost is melting. You probably heard that permafrost, which is soil, frozen soil in the Arctic, which is very rich in, uh, in gases, is melting. And if the soil melts, will evaporate the ice, the, the gas, and the gas is methane, is greenhouse gas, which further amplify the, the, the initial warming. So, this is an example of another feedback effect, positive feedback effect. So we have many, many different compartments which are already uh, uh, show an alteration of the, of the climate system. And here we are. So we are actually starting from uh, the very beginning. I told you we are following uh, the, the, the structure of the book that I've shown you, uh, Earth Climate, uh, Past, Present and Future. The book is done in... Uh, actually in uh, four main, five, sorry, five main parts. Uh, and we are more or less following, and it will be a journey through time. So we will start from the, we will give a, a framework of climate science, uh, briefly summarizing how climate works, all the exchange of energy, transport of energy, uh, the role of atmosphere, of land, of ocean, of cryosphere, of biosphere, all the things we will briefly describe in part one. Then we will start our journey through time. We will start from the very beginning, from the 4.5 billion years ago, and we will come through uh, the, the millions of years, and then to the thousands of years, and then to historical time, and then today, and then we plan to project climate into the future. We plan to do all that in the next few weeks. So. Uh, we will deal about tectonic scale, the regulator of the big uh, chrono thermometer that we have, the orbital scale change, Milankovic theory and why it partially works but not completely. And then we know quite well glacial the glacial time, what happened during the last 20,000 years. And then on part five we will speak about historical and future climate. So that's more or less how we will progress during the next uh, Two months? I don't remember. I will ask some colleagues to give you part of the work because they are more expert than me in some things. And so I want you to expose to the very best of the knowledge that we have. So that's why we, we work. And I will tell you next time about the exams that are you, I think you are very much interested. <laughs> okay.